Pencil, online. HPG connection, online. Educational module, online. All systems, nominal. Hello, everybody, and welcome to On the Origin of Battle Mechs podcast. My name is Brent Stewart McKee. My co hosts today are. I'm Joshua. I'm Connor. I'm Jeff. And today is episode five, and we are going to be talking about a iconic battle mech, the Banshee. And if you have ever faced one of these down, you have probably wailed in agony. Or you've laughed at it because it has nothing on it. Before the show, we actually had a fun discussion. What is the standard Banshee? For me, it's the 3E. It's the original Banshee from TRO 3025. But of course, with the new supplementary material that Catalyst is putting out, specifically the experimental tech volumes, we get to look at primitive designs. So that's why we're going to be starting off with the Banshee BNC-1E. But before that, the general design quirks that uh, all of them suffer from or have a bonus from are they are distracting, and they also have a bad reputation up until the clan invasion. It's also important to note that every faction has one of these. These are a staple of every military usually in garrisons though how many of them have the easy to maintain quirk that the one e has just the one e interesting all right speaking of the one e this is the fifth battle mech design to enter production but interestingly enough the emperor actually because its prototypes were the first mechs and it didn't receive a production run till much later the banshee one e is the fourth battle mech after right after the kyoto to enter full-scale production that was in 2445 wasn't it Yep. And it has full hand actuators, which, as we discussed in a previous episode, is a huge innovation and very useful. Second mech with hand actuators and the first mech with two hand actuators. It also had a lower production cost than the Mackie. As we know, if you can produce more of them, you're probably going to be able to sell them to the military. Lowest bidder is a thing. It is quite an imposing looking design, though. Mm -hmm. Well, that's why it has the design quirk of distracting, which means that it affects the morale of the opposing pilot if you're in the same hex as it. Yeah, it does the death's head motif before the Atlas does. We've been talking about how battle mech design is an iterative process, and we're seeing changes and growth in each of these designs as they come out for the first time. And that Banshee really kind of shows the leaps that have been taken since the Mackie, because it does almost exactly what the Mackie does, but it's a little little bit lighter and it is significantly cheaper and easier to produce and easier to maintain at least for this initial variant the uh 1e is in my opinion relatively lightly armed for an assault mech having only a ppc an auto cannon class 5 a small laser and that's it two medium lasers two mediums and so yeah pardon me as well as the medium lasers it is lightly armed, but you got to remember this is a primitive, so they don't have the weight savings that later standardized technology would have. Yes. So this unit, by the 26th century, it was mothballed and sent to militia units where it served on planetary garrisons, and eventually many of them were upgraded to the BNC-3E, which will be the next one we talk about. The uh, battle value for the 1E is 1458. So the 3E was immediately accepted after the success of the 1E and became one of the most produced battle mechs of its time, perhaps of all time. I don't know if I've seen any other numbers this big for a battle mech. 5,000 units in 10 years. In that time frame, that is a large production cycle. To me, this is the quintessential Banshee because it's the 3025 Tiro Banshee. It actually goes faster. It bumps up to 4.6, so 64 kilometers an hour over the 50 kilometers an hour of the 1E. Maintains similar weapons loadout, but it drops the two medium lasers. So it is quite lightly armed for a, an assault mech. When I said that about the 1E, this was the actual one I was thinking of. This is one of the first mechs I ever actually encountered while playing classic Battletech. 15 tons of armor, that seems pretty light for a 95-ton mech too, doesn't it? It's about on par, I think, actually. It is contemporary with other assault battle mechs. It also, you know, bumps up from the primitive to the standard armor, so it is more efficient. The standard D model Atlas has 19 tons, and standard Cyclops Z has 10 tons. So 15 tons is pretty on the nose for a 95er. And one thing to note about the 3E is it is very heat efficient. Even if you're unloading with a full alpha strike, you're only generating 12 heat, so... 
it's sinking 16 even with a run that's only 14 you're still venting more heat than you're generating that said if you are doing an alpha strike it's a maximum of 18 damage inside of three hexes you can't fire the small laser and inside of three hexes you're taking penalties on that ppc your effective damage output is 15 points as well as the autocan five that also has a minimum range of three yeah it's interesting this guy he's a damage sponge with 15 tons of armor he's fast moving but once he gets in close he's pretty much relying on those two big fists to punch other mechs because his main weaponry is no longer effective so the battle value for this guy we got at 1422 and the next one of note though there isn't actually anything on the tabletop with this is the BNC 3EA, which was a prototype designed for the Nossal Summer Games, specifically Battle Chess, because why not play a game of chess with battle mechs? Sure. <laughs> yeah, that sounds like the kind of crappy idea an EA would be part of. Hey, oh. well, where would you put it, though? What, what position would you play it in for chess? It was Queen. Uh, right here. It traded its PPC for a large laser, adding a single rear-facing small laser in each side torso and a forward-facing medium laser in the center torso. There's no record sheet for this guy, so like I said, it's just in the, the novels, just in the lore, because you're not really going to want to play with something like that. It was designed for a competition, but it is an interesting historical note. So after the EA, we have the Banshee BNC 3M. Which is a free world league design. Yep. Again, so a lot of these early mechs, kind of the letter tells you where it's from. The 3M trades the Auto Cannon 5 for a second PPC and a pair of medium lasers. And still has that small laser. Yep. That guy's going to run hot. Yeah, you still got the same amount of heat sinking, so that's not very efficient then, is it? And that was at 2579. Was was there doubles by that point? No, we're still a, f a few years out from doubles. Yeah, so he, he can generate 27 heat with a full alpha strike, but only sink 16. That one clocks in at 1595. Because it's hot and they were running short on PPCs, they created the 3Q. The 2915 Merrick variant. It removes both the Autocannon 5 and the PPC, replacing them with, with an Autocannon 20, and then it maintains a small laser. I mean, he's still really lightly armed because he's got what? Should have two medium lasers. Small laser and an AC 20. That's it? That's, That's it. it. Damn. But, I mean, at least he knows what he wants to do. He's fast for an assault mech because he's 4'6", and he's got short-range weapons. He just wants to charge through all your firepower, get up close, shoot you with that AC-20, and then punch you in the face. Of the variants we've covered thus far, I feel this one knows its job a little better than the rest. It's still pretty light on weapons, though. Yeah. It is. But because of that, it's reflected in its battle value being only 1394. Then in 3026, we get to what is probably the epitome of the introductory tech Banshees, the Banshee 3S. They downrated the engine, so instead of 4.6, it goes 3.5, 50 kilometers an hour, which is standard for most heavy assault mechs. But that gives it room to take a lot more firepower. Its loadout is two small lasers, one in the head and one in the center torso, an SRM-6 in the right torso, four medium lasers in the right torso, one PPC in the right torso, an AC-10 in the left torso, and an additional PPC in the left arm. And it gains five heat sinks, so it can actually fire both those PPCs at the same time. Yeah, it'll be able to sink all 20 of that heat, no problem. That's what makes it such a great mech is at a walk, it can fire both PPCs and not gain any heat. At a run, it can fire both PPCs and gain just one heat. And then with the Auto Cannon 10, you can bump up and gain a little more heat for 30 points of damage. And then if you want, once you hit three or four heat and you're like, I need to sink a little bit of that heat so I don't start taking penalties, you then stop shooting one of your PPCs and you fire a PPC in the Auto Cannon 10 for a single round, come back under your heat threshold, and then you can start hammering with both PPCs again. And then once you get inside the PPCs minimum range, you've got those four medium lasers, which equal the damage output. You've got an SRM-6 and you can keep on shooting that at AC-10, and actually all of those shorter range weapons for in-close don't generate even close to enough heat to 
hit your threshold. So once it gets in close, it can just fire all day long. If it's taken a little bit of engine damage, it can pretty much keep on shooting. It's uh, really well balanced for bracket firing, long range, short range. It definitely seems more of a contemporary sort of assault mech, doesn't it? Yeah. Yeah, seeing one of these on the battlefield would not be out of place. It's definitely solid. It's something to worry about. And its battle value rings at 1751. Reflecting how good it is. Because that is significantly above any of the other Banshees we've talked about. Yeah, about a 300 battle value increase. So the 3S has a uh, custom variant which has a record sheet. The Rains Blast. I think I'm pronouncing that correctly. Rains Blast. It trades out its PPCs for an LRM-10 and a hatchet and a large laser. This feels like some sort of brawler or Solaris game mech. I was going to say this feels like a Solaris game mech, yeah. It is not uncommon for pilots to mod their mechs to have physical weapons, especially since their arenas are confined either physically or by the bounds of where you can go. And having a one-on-one, if you can get a good first hit with a physical weapon, that puts you in a very advantageous position. So the battle value for the Rhine's Blast is 1678. A little bit of a bump down, replacing the PPCs with the LRM-10 and the large laser, but it's still very, very respectable on the battlefield. So then we have the Banshee BNC 3MC. Looks like it comes in TRO Succession Wars. I'm not actually familiar with this uh, Banshee. It appears to remove five heat sinks and the AC-5, replacing that with an AC-10. Otherwise, it is identical to 3E. That's actually a decent upgrade, I think. You're still running a little hot, but it's it's not as hot as the one that trades the autocannon 5 for a PPC, but you're still bumping up to that 10 points of damage. I definitely think this is better than the 3. Well, the 3 is a particularly low bar. You know, yes. It's one of the first assault mechs you go up against in video games for a reason. It's a damage sponge. It presents a threat, but not an overwhelming one. It's probably more dangerous if it punches you or kicks you. I think there's also the 3 MR as well, isn't it? A like jihad refit that does double heat sinks. ER PPC, ER medium lasers, that's significantly more heat efficient. You can you can actually use those weapons. Yeah, you're not able to alpha strike with that guy, but pretty darn close each turn. Before we get too far ahead, the battle value for the BNC-3MC is 1487, and the battle value for the BNC-3MR is 1801, which is a, quite a bit of a jump, which is reflected, of course, in the double heat sinks we talked about just moments ago, and the two ER PPCs. So chronologically, after the 3MC, we get the first standard tech Banshee in 3053, so three years after the clans invade, and it's the Banshee 5S. This guy goes back to that 4.6, so 64 kilometer an hour movement profile, but it takes an XL engine trading a little bit of survivability to really give it that assault mech firepower it was lacking before. It represents a much more potent threat on the tabletop. Yep, it's got Brent's favorite, a Goss Rifle. Yay! Two ER PPCs, an SRM-6, and then four medium lasers, two in the left arm and then two rear-facing. So you could potentially bring four to bear in the rear arc? Yes, yes you could, as long as you twist the proper direction. Oh, unless, yeah, I'd I'd have to look at how that works out, because the twist might put the, the rear arc ones out of the way uh and then it's got a pair of small lasers something with about the banshee and small lasers i guess (laughs) well it needs something to follow up its punch with right yep and then it also upgrades to uh double heat sinks so it can sink 28 heat every turn with 14 double heat sinks which kind of puts it back into the bracket of the 3s because it can't alpha strike with everything but it can bracket fire very well it is also important to note that this is a Lyran design, and it also used an XL engine. Used primarily in militias, in the Commonwealth slash Alliance, as well as the Word of Blake when they are around. And it has a battle value of 2065. It also has two named variants, the BNC-5S Sawyer and the BNC-5S Vandergriff. So the Sawyer... The Sawyer's got an ER PPC and removes a heat sink, but it adds four jump jets. It trades some firepower and heat management for mobility. 
the Sawyer was piloted by the notable pilot Trent Bullfrog Sawyer, and he got that nickname because of the jump jets and his penchant for trying to jump behind an opponent and then unleash his remaining ERPPC Gauss rifle, medium lasers, and SRM-6 into the rear armor of his enemies. Its battle value is going to be 2094. The other variant of the 5S is the Vandergriff, which also includes the jump jets. This SRM is reduced to a SRM-4 as opposed to the 6. Uh, maintains the two ERPPCs. It drops two medium lasers. It drops the small lasers. And it has an LB-10X autocannon in the left torso. And I believe it drops some heat sinks. Now, does it replace the Gauss rifle with that LB-10? Yes, that's what it looks like. Because I was wondering, like, that's a lot of firepower. Pardon me there, I forgot that it had the Gauss rifle. That one has a battle value of 1,853. I think when they step up to the 6S, I think is the next variant. Uh, it's got a light fusion engine. It's got an endo steel chassis, an LBX auto cannon 10, and a heavy Gauss rifle. It, may, it retains small lasers of their 3E model, and it's got 14 and a half tons of armor. Trading firepower for survivability here, dropping down from that vulnerable XL to a light engine. And then I find it interesting that the traded two PPCs for one LB-10, because that's an LB-10 weighs quite a bit, especially with its ammo. And they also upgraded to a heavy Gauss rifle. Yes. That's, that's a lot of punch right there. Yeah, the heavy Gauss rifle definitely allows you to reach out and just punch someone real hard. The heavy gauss rifle is it's really good up close but its damage drops off as you get out there yeah from 25 to 20 to 10 but with the lxb 10 you know you're wanting to close range you're not sniping at, with this guy this is something where you're moving into the thick of it trading punches opening up with what you got its two weapons match up nicely with their short range. Both have a short range of six hexes. So you can be shooting 25 damage slugs out of that heavy Gauss rifle and then firing cluster munitions out of that LB-10X to take advantage of the holes you're putting in things with that heavy Gauss rifle. It's got two tons of ammo for that LB-10 and five tons of ammo for that heavy Gauss rifle. Which results in 20 shots with the Gauss and 20 shots with the 10X, 10 of which being cluster, 10 of which being slugs. This is a very heat neutral mech as well. Unloading everything, you're generating 5, running that 7, you can sink 20. If anything, this is drastically oversynced. It really is. You're not overheating in this thing. No, you can run up to a fire starter and go, sup. <laughs> not, for, not for long. <laughs> yeah, but if you're using a, a 95 ton to counter a 35 ton fire starter, I think the fire starter's making back its money. <laughs> <laughs> that that right there, and then on top of that, you can't stand in front of it for long, but you're not going to be standing in front of it for long with the heavy gauss and the LB-10. <laughs> the battle value for this guy is going to be 1889. So next we have, according to Master Unit List, we have the Banshee John Bauer. I think we can do this in 24 hours or less, right, guys? <laughs> Boy. It debuted in 3063, and I actually have never seen a record sheet for this guy. I don't have one here. I wasn't able to find it in my search either, so it might be one that's just in the fiction. It is not on the Sarna either, so... Where did you come across it? It's uh, right there on Master Unit List. 3050 Upgrade... Oh, it's for a notable mech warrior. Oh, okay. Captain John Bauer, company commander in the 3rd Royal Guards. He freelances with his unit, a trait that would normally cost him his commission if it wasn't for his successes. He prefers to move quickly and hit opponents at long range with his precise aim. Once the enemy is aware of his presence, he's not afraid to get close and use his mech's devastating physical attacks. So it doesn't say there's actually any difference between his the, the 5S and John Bauer's mech. I think it's just a reference to the TV show. That's, that's my guess. Probably. I mean, he does have an Alpha Strike card, but no record sheet, so at least none that we can find. If anybody's found an official record sheet for us, please send it to us because we'd be interested to see what exactly his mech is rocking. Once we get past named one there, we go to the Banshee 7S. 
So the Banshee 7S has an ER medium laser in its right torso paired with an SRM-6 and a ER medium laser in its left torso paired with a Gauss rifle. The right arm has two ER medium lasers and the left arm has an ER PPC. This guy's moving with a speed of 4 and 6. It's from the Civil War era and it's going to be sinking 28 heat with those double heat sinks that has become pretty standard in this chassis. According to TRO 3050 upgrade, the main difference between the Banshee 5S and the Banshee 7S we're talking about now is the 7S drops a PPC in order to swap from an XL engine to a light engine. So there we're trading a little bit of damage for a little bit of survivability. And then it uses any extra tonnage to add some more armor. Once again, up in survivability. So 5S is going to be your, your firepower mech. 7S is going to be your defensive mech. Next up is the BNC 8S. So this variant of the Banshee was created by Word of Blake after her, they took over Hesperus 2 in 3070. So it basically becomes like a, a brawler profile. So they have a TSM hatchet XL engine from the 5S. Keeps the ubiquitous small laser that the Banshee oh. seems to cling, cling on to. LBX auto cannon antennas retained from the 6S and they'll move to the other side. It's a ER large laser for long range, some of those PPC. Uh, XL gyro frees up some tonnage for some four medium lasers. Uh, two of those extended immediately are small laser. So it drops down to 13 double heat sinks to sort of maintain the balance for that TSM. Uh, C3 slave unit allows it to share the targeting data and 18 tons of armor and Guardian ECM. So battle value for that is 2369. This is a really interesting one for me because it uses a C3 slave rather than a C3i, C3 improved. But it's a Word of Blake mech, and Word of Blake almost never, I think this is the exception, uses C3i. So I don't I don't understand why Word of Blake made this variant. Maybe they were planning on selling them to mercenaries they hired. So the master unit list battle value is listed at 2408, which is a, another discrepancy from the record sheets. Notable the first one that is not a layout discrepancy but it's a word of blake one so we're seeing a trend at least the same thing stands i'm not surprised that it's the word of blake this record sheet is a uh, mech factory so the discrepancy may be buried somewhere in mech factory's layout for it I got master unit list at 2408 and the record sheet from Catalyst at 2369. Okay, I haven't seen the Catalyst record sheets. It might be a tweak since they were printed. Next variant is the 9S. It was a upgrade of the 8S produced by Defiance Industries. It has a ER medium in the head as opposed to the usual small laser that we've seen in the head. Breaking with tradition. It is. Shameless. Yeah. <laughs> It mounts a targeting computer and an SRM-6 in the right torso, a Gauss rifle and a medium laser in the left torso, two ER mediums in the right arm, and then a heavy and light PPC in the left arm. It has a total of 14 double heat sinks, and yeah. I think I like the 8S a little bit better because I like C3, but this 9S is a solid, solid mech. It has the light engine we've seen on quite a few of these chassis, although it does go down to the, the 3.5 movement as opposed to the 4.6 we've been seeing. Yes, yeah, so this kind of harkens back to that 3S. It also has the XL gyro carrying on from the 8S. And the big problem with that XL gyro, you're trading weight for reduced survivability because it takes up twice as much space as a standard gyro. Yes, the record sheet from Catalyst has its battle value at 2496. Which is what Master Unilist says. Not what Sarna says, because Sarna says it is 2487. So there's another little discrepancy there. As a reminder, Master Unit List is a official source, so if you're going to be going off something, that's probably what you should be going off of. It is also how you calculate your pilot values in addition to the battle values of the mechs. I would always recommend if you're making your list for classic, you use Master Unit List. So then now, chronological order, we get to that Banshee 3MR that Jeff mentioned earlier. But since we've already covered it, I don't think we need to go over it again. Just wanted to point out, this is when it comes out in 3073. Absolutely. And then in 3076, we get an experiment in armor. The Banshee 11X is an experimental tech, mixed tech. It's got a Clan XL engine. Its firepower is kind of light. It's got two bombast lasers, uh, aka charge them up, let them fly. It's got a silver bullet Gauss rifle, which is a Gauss 
LBX. Brent, do you want to explain how you can accelerate shotgun style pellets out of a Gauss rifle? Well, I'm not entirely sure because the concept of a flechette or shotgun shell usually has a wadding or cup that protects the barrel from damage because you will have loose lead shot that will rattle around if it's not insulated from the barrel. So we do this to prevent damage. I'm not entirely sure how one would build a protective cup or wadding for a gauss rifle. The damage and also accuracy at range I feel would drop off quite drastically but this is also science fiction so battle mech space wizards did it. You can always attribute it to space magic. My question is, what are these bombast lasers? Bombast lasers. These guys are are another one of those space magic type things where you're, yeah, yeah they're they're space magic. Oh, I, I'm just I'm, I'm looking at the uh, the record sheet here, and for damage, there's an asterisk. What what is what does it do? So according to its technical entry, the Bombast laser is meant to be the ultimate laser weapon without growing to be the heaviest energy weapon. The way it works is you basically have to charge it up. So you you basically, it's weird. It's one of those, just leave it in the experimental rules and don't. This right here is the sort of reason why over at the WNRP regiment, we don't use experimental tech. Gotcha. Yes. So it can do <laughs> between seven and 12 points of damage. So to try and understand this from what I can read, which is loose, but the, the loose idea is you're taking a laser and you're funneling energy into it each turn and it charges up and cycles up until you release it. That's the fluff on it, but the actual rules for it is you just set how much damage you want to do, and then you pay a hit modifier for it. Uh, if you're trying to do max damage of 12, you have a, an additional plus 3 hit modifier, and then if you're... I, I'm not seeing exactly how, how it works on my source here, but basically if you... I'm guessing if you fire it at 7 points of damage, like 7 to 8 points of damage, you take no penalty, and then the more power you put into it, the more unstable it becomes basically so it looks like the target modifier is current damage minus minimum damage divided by two rounded up so minimum damage would be seven so you pick a number subtract that from seven divided by two round up that's your modifier that's weird yeah it seems overly complicated for no reason and that's saying something in battle tech it's just clunky. The way it works in game doesn't match the way its text reads. They're just clunky. So it, it seems like you're always going to be suffering at least a plus one to hit if you're doing the seven. If you're doing somewhere around 10, you're going to be suffering a, a plus two. And if you're doing the full 12, it's a plus three. This seems entirely unnecessary. Well, that's why it's experimental tech. The last weapon brings the Banshee back to its touchstone, its talisman, true secret to its power, the small laser. In this case, it's an ER laser. It's always mounted in the head. Yep. Modular armor. Again, it's one of those experimental techs that's weird. In this case, it grants you an extra 10 points of armor to the locations that have it, but it reduces your speed and it adds a plus one piloting skill modifier to any piloting rolls you take. So honestly, you're probably better off with hardened armor, which is why modular armor isn't generally used. Going back to the Banshee 11X here, this entire mech just seems unnecessary. In its TRO, they basically comment that there's no point to this except that we're Lyrans and we don't let our assault mechs die. Well, hey, I'm a fan of the Lyrans and I'm calling this thing unnecessary. <laughs> And it's got to be so expensive because you've got that Clan XL engine, you've got the modular armor, you've got the bombast lasers, you've got a silver bullet goss. This is some social general's baby, and it's never going to be fielded in significant numbers. No, it is definitely a prototype or a proof of concept, and I don't think it's passing. <laughs> <laughs> 
3109, we get the Banshee 9S2. And I don't know if we mentioned it in a previous podcast, but basically when you see a naming convention like that, where you've got the a standard number, that the 9S in this situation, followed by a 2, that generally means the previous version of that, so in this case the Banshee 9S, was some sort of Word of Blake variant. We usually used improved C3, C3i, and it was a good design, but nobody has access to C3i. So after Word of Blake was defeated, people take that uh, C3i out and they generally put us in some sort of C3 slave. So the 9S2 looks like it pretty much matches the 9S's weapons loadout, but it has a C3 boosted slave in the right torso. Am I missing anything with it? No, I don't think so. From what I can tell, it looks essentially identical. Yeah, it just gets that uh, boosted slave. It is missing two ER mediums. Or the 9S2 uh, strips out two ER mediums and puts in a boosted slave. Maybe a little bit less armor because you need a third ton. Two ER mediums and a regular medium. Okay, there it is. It drops from the four to one. But in all honesty, that's probably a better design because you're still rocking your Gauss rifle, your heavy PPC, your light PPC. It's more heat efficient. Well, not just more heat efficient, but you're taking out those short range weapons and you're adding a C3S. Now you've got, this thing is going to make a great sniper because that slave, it's not going to be blocked by standard ECM. Someone will have to bring Angel ECM to shut you down. A potent sniper. It has an additional light PPC as well. It has two light PPCs. Okay, now I'm confused. This this is a messy one again. Where's it getting that? Uh, I have so no one, idea. One light in each arm and a heavy in the left arm. It loses the SRM. That's what it is. Yeah, the, it loses the SRM. Okay. Sorry, I missed that in my first glance. I've been bouncing back and forth here. So yeah, it drops the SRM and three medium lasers for another light PPC and C3. C3. Yeah, so now it's even got more long-range firepower. Two light PPCs, a heavy PPC, and a Gauss rifle. You're looking at 40 damage yep. at 18 hexes. With C3 and targeting computer. That's a solid sniper. Yeah. That'll make something go down fast. Especially if you can get head hits with either the heavy PPC or the Gauss rifle. And the battle value 2 for the 9S2 is 2426. Running through the list uh, for Alpha Strike point values, the primitive Banshee 1E is 38 PV, Banshee 3E is also 38 PV, 3M is 39, the 3Q is 37, 3S and the 3S Reinsblatt are both 45, the Banshee 3MC is 37, the 5 5S is 42, the 5S Sawyer is 41, the 5S Vandergriff is 39, the 6S is 37, Bauer is 39, the 7S is 43, the 8S is 50, the 9S is 51, the 3MR is 41, the 11X is 47, and the 9S2 is 54. That's interesting because the 9S is 2,496 battle value, and the 9S2 is 2,426. So a 70 BV advantage in favor of the 9S, but the 9S is three Alpha Strike points cheaper than the 9S2. Well, I imagine that's how the uh, game rules change using the C3s. Most likely. Also the change in weaponry. So uh, notable pilots? Yeah, we've covered a bunch of them in the uh, episode already, but any that haven't been mentioned? One that I thought was interesting right here on, on Sarna is Marshal Sharon Bryan. Uh, they piloted a Banshee during the invasion of Huntress until it was destroyed by Smoke Jaguar Cauldron Born. Her variant used two PPCs and one Gauss. It's, like, it's believed to be a 5S. So now that we've talked about all of the pilots, what are our feelings about the mech in general? It's iconic in every sense of the word it's a presence on the battlefield much like others that we have talked about it has that death's head to intimidate people it's all over the place there's so many variants that you can almost pick one for any role. I feel it's an iconic mech that has a range of variants that allows you to basically use it as an, op an opponent's mech and you can just slide that difficulty up and down using the base value of the mech. Yeah, there's a variant for everything. Since I started playing Battletech, I've been seeing these things on the table across from me in my own lists and everything. When I think of an assault mech, the first thing I think of is an Atlas, and the next thing I think of is the Banshee. 
I like the sniper variants because those all seem to be more efficient. You really seem to run into this kind of, it tries to be a bracket fighter or it tries to be fast, but then it has to be poorly armed or fragile with an XL engine. So the, the ones that are most comfortable with their role tend to be the ones that go, I got lots of PPCs. I got some sort of Gauss rifle or auto cannon. I know what I want to do and it's sit there at mid range and just hammer people. Great thing about it, you got the 3S, the 9S, and you can buy a Banshee mech and know you can play an effective, relevant variant of that mech at any point in Battletech history. Like if you're starting a Battletech list on a budget and you want a handful of mechs to flesh out your Game of Armored Combat box, the Banshee is going to be a good buy because whoever you play with, whenever you play, you're going to be able to field a tough, hard-hitting assault mech. And remember, the Banshee really shines when it's in a dedicated role. So when you're building your list, keep that in mind. Well, on top of that, it doesn't matter who you're playing. If you're playing one of the successor states or mercenaries or pirates, whatever, everyone has this thing. It doesn't matter who you're painting your, your miniatures as. The Banshee will fit. Everyone has this thing. Yeah, the ability to field any force you want, regardless of paint job, it's just an asset, especially when you're trying to get people into the game. And so, you know, check this thing out. You can play this house or this house or this house. And that's a way to hook them into the lore because you can go like, well, they all have this, but only they have this. But why do only they have this? Well, let me tell you about such and such. <laughs> One of those things that if someone's trying to get into this and they haven't decided how they want to paint their mechs, it's a good mech to get, because if you're playing inter anything in the Inner Sphere, they're going to have this mech. Even the periphery. Yeah, it's especially the uh, Introtech ones, they're everywhere. Some of the later ones are a little more rarefied, but... I I'm primarily meant the chassis as opposed to all, all the variants. Yeah, I mean, the, the 3S, which is probably the most efficient of the intro tech ones, the 3025 ones, that's available to mercenaries and the periphery all the way into 3145. It just seems like a solid, well-rounded platform. It stood the test of time. It, of the mechs we've discussed thus far, by my understanding, it's one of the only ones that's always been around. You know, the Kyoto, it went away for a while. Banshee never did. Yeah, you're right. The only other one, even remotely, like the kind of longevity it has is going to be the Emperor. But even that can't match just the sheer prolification of the Banshee. Again, why it deserves the term iconic. Our sources for our episode today are, as always, Sarna and Experimental Tech Volume 2. The TRO and RS for Succession Wars, 3050 Upgrades, TRO and RS, 3085 Old is the New Record Sheets, Experimental Tech Steiner, and Master Unit List is the official source, as always, for all point values. Shoutouts to Sarna and Master Unit List again for enabling the community to continue to play this fantastic game in this amazing world. And as always, shoutouts to uh, Wolfnet. We are supported by our Patreons at patreon.com backslash on the origin of battle mechs. Our social media on Twitter is at origin of mechs. We also have a dedicated channel on the Everything Battletech Discord. Feel free to stop by and say hi. If you have any questions, requests for topics, or wish to contact us, our email is on the origin of battle mechs at gmail.com. If you enjoy the show, I encourage you to let your friends know about us and to leave a review. Special thanks to my friend Laura for the intro and outro. I hope everybody has a wonderful day. Peace out, Mech Warriors. Make it a great one. Catch you later. Module complete. System standby. Would you like to load the next module? Nope. Uh, so the five... Or the... Now you got me screwed up. Yeah. <laughs>